Szanowni Państwo, dzień dobry. Witam Państwa w Łazienkach Królewskich na pierwszym wykładzie z cyklu wykładów naukowych towarzyszących wystawie absolutnie wyjątkowego dla nas obrazu, czyli jeźdźca polskiego Rembrandta ze zbiorów The Freak Collection w Nowym Jorku. Dziś, bohaterem dzisiejszego wykładu, poza oczywiście jeźdźcem polskim i Rembrandtem, jest dr Xavier Salomon, którego widzą Państwo po mojej prawej stronie. Dr Salomon jest brytyjskim rytkiem sztuki, zastępcą i głównym kuratorem The Freak Collection w Nowym Jorku. Doktorat obronił na Kurtold Institute of Art, a tematem jego pracy był kardynał, mecenas, kardyn, mecenat kardynała Pietro Aldo Brandiniego. Przy okazji chciałabym Państwa zaprosić na pozostałe wykłady. 18 maja będą mogli Państwo posłuchać profesora doktora habilitowanego Michała Janochy, który opowie nam o Rembrandcie i jego relacjach do małych, małych mistrzów holenderskich. 8 czerwca w tej sali posłuchamy profesora Antoniego Zięby, który wygłosi wykład pod tytułem Rembrandt i uczniowie, jak powstawały obrazy w warsztacie mistrza. Wykład dedykowany pamięci profesora Ernsta van den Wetteringa. A 15 czerwca posłuchają Państwo tutaj wykładu doktora Seweryna Malawskiego z Politechniki Lubelskiej, który opowie nam o królewskiej kolekcji roślin cytrusowych i wymiany tej kolekcji, części tej kolekcji za obraz Jeździec Polski. Oddaję może już głos Xavieremu. Wykład będzie po angielsku, natomiast później dla Państwa, którzy, którzy nie znają angielskiego, Zaproponujemy retransmisję wideo z podpisami w języku polskim, jak również w zapisie mowy, mówią, mowy znaków. Także oddaję głos. Thank you. A, dziękuję, Małgorzata. Szanowni Państwo, a dobry wieczór. I'm sorry I won't be speaking in Polish this evening, but um, I hope my English will be clear. Um, so if we can start with the first slide. I'm not sure. Can you see it? No? Is it? Sorry. In uh, mid-August 1791, the diplomat and collector Michał Kazimierz Oginski wrote to King Stanislaw August, Sire, I'm sending your majesty a Cossack whom Rembrandt had set on his horse. This horse has eaten during his stay with me for 420 gulden. Your majesty's justice and generosity allows me to expect that orange trees will flower in the same proportion. 231 years later, only two weeks ago, I accompanied that same Cossack by Rembrandt back to Poland. Instead of by horse across Europe, I flew over the Atlantic overnight. But I kept thinking that I was the second person after Oginski to bring this masterpiece to Poland. The painting by Rembrandt is now on view for the next three months here in the picture gallery on the Palace of the Isle at, Ro at Royal Wazienki where it was in the early 19th century, and back in a frame that exactly replicates the one it had when the painting was in Poland. Tonight, tonight's lecture is about the journeys of the so-called Polish rider. It is about where it was and when and what it meant to different audiences along its travels. A great masterpiece by a significant artist like Rembrandt is a work of art that speaks to people in different ways across the centuries, across time, and across space. We absolutely do not know what the Polish writer meant to Rembrandt himself. Like other great works of art by him, and just to give you two examples, the so-called Night Watch or the Jewish Bride, for example, I doubt he would recognize these paintings under the present titles. The so-called Night Watch, and let's start by saying that the scene is in fact not set at night at all, but it is meant to represent a day scene, 
should more appropriately be called the Militia Company of District 2 under the command of Captain Franz Banning Koch, which clearly is not as exciting as the Night Watch. Rembrandt intended this as a militia group portrait, very much in the tradition of works by other contemporary Dutch artists. The title of Night Watch, under which we still know the portrait, was first used in the late 18th century. The Jewish bride also has nothing to do with a Jewish wedding. The title was given to the painting in the early 19th century when it was interpreted by one of its owners as a Jewish father placing a necklace around the neck of her daughter going out as a bride. We still do not know what this painting actually means, but it is likely to represent either a historical or a biblical scene. Abraham and Sarah, Bose and Ruth, or Rebecca, uh, having been suggested among many other ideas. Two other Rembrandts uh, that were once in the collection of Stanisław August and displayed here at Wajenki with the Polish rider were also described erroneously in the past as a Jewish girl and her father, a rabbi. Most likely, these two paintings were intended to be fantasy figures, tronies, and not even originally probably planned as pendants. When it first arrived in Poland in 1791, the canvas by Rembrandt received, as we will see, the title of Cossack on Horseback, only to be baptized as Lisowczek in 1811 and Polish Rider in 1898. But Rembrandt most likely intended the painting to signify something completely different, something that we still have not been able to identify, notwithstanding generations of studies and publications. Julius Held wrote about it in 1944. Rembrandt may have called him by a definite name. There is little hope that we will ever know it. This evening, I will focus only tangentially on the subject of this painting, and I will not go into a huge detail as to the costume of the figure. These would be the subjects for other long lectures. Instead, I plan to talk about what we know about the painting's travels, and how it was interpreted along the way and what it meant to people who owned it. But let's start from the beginning and from a very foggy and doubtful beginning we have to start. Here is Rembrandt in 1652 in a self-portrait now in Vienna, a few years before he painted the Polish rider. And here is the place where most likely the masterpiece was painted, created. Rembrandt's house on the Breestraat today the Rembrandt's House Museum in Amsterdam. Rembrandt was born in Leiden on the 15th of July, 1606, but between 1625 and 31, he established a workshop in Leiden in partnership with another painter, Jan Lievens. At the end of 1631, he moved to Amsterdam where he lived with the art dealer, Hendrik van Eulenburg for the first four years. On the 22nd of June, 1634, Rembrandt married Eulenburg's cousin, Saskia. Rembrandt's success in Amsterdam allowed him to move out of Eulenburg's household around 1635, and in January 1639, he bought a large house on the Breestraat, next door to Eulenburg. He purchased the house from Christoph, Christoffel Thies for the hefty price of 13,000 guilders. The painter's early biographers note his taste for expensive objects and curiosities, and how these were displayed in this house, where Rembrandt also had a studio and ran his big, uh, rather large workshop. In 1868, the biographer Filippo Baldinucci recalled, he, Rembrandt, went to public sales by auction often, and here he bought clothes that were old-fashioned and cast off as long as they struck him as bizarre and picturesque. Even though at times they were downright dirty, he hung them on the walls of his studio among the beautiful curiosities which he also took pleasures, pleasure in owning. These included every kind of old and modern arms and weapons, arrows, halibards, daggers, sabers, knives, and so on, and innumerable quantities of exquisite drawings, engravings, medals, and every other thing which he thought a painter might ever need. And here you see um, a reconstruction of Rembrandt's um, Kunstkammer, we can call it, collection. Um, of course, none of the original objects survive, but this is what has been recreated at the Rembrandt's house to give you an idea of how it would have looked during Rembrandt's lifetime. More of Rembrandt's work were inspired, inspired by such works. 
For example, in the mid-1650s, around the same time he painted the Polish rider, he is known to have copied a series of Indian Mughal miniatures, intrigued by their exotic costumes and their weapons. But we know that Rembrandt was also inspired by many different sources. In the mid-1650s, Rembrandt produced some of his most famous works. This canvas, for example, if encountered today with no documentation, would baffle all viewers as to its actual subject matter. Who is this man contemplating an ancient bust? And what is his outfit? Thanks to documents, however, we know exactly that this large canvas, now at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, was commissioned in 1653 by the Sicilian aristocrat Antonio Ruffo. And Antonio Ruffo is quite interesting because uh, he never met Rembrandt, but he is really the first collector of Rembrandt, let's say, by post. He heard of Rembrandt in Amsterdam and started buying Rembrandts without ever having seen one and having them shipped to Sicily during Rembrandt's lifetime. And the painting, we know from these letters, was meant to represent Aristotle with a bust of Homer. Rembrandt depicted the Greek philosopher dressed in an absolute fantasy outfit that is everything except from Greek, resting his hand on a bust of Homer, woefully looking at it. Without the letters between the patron and the painter, it would be impossible for us today to identify the elegantly dressed bearded man with his broad hat and gold chain as the Greek philosopher Aristotle. While no document allows us to identify precisely the year of its making, the Polish rider is traditionally dated around 1655 and was therefore painted in the studio of the house on the Bristrat when Rembrandt was at the height of his career, as well as, however, on the verge of major changes in his life. In 1656, Rembrandt declared bankruptcy and was dispossessed of all his belongings which was sold in a series of six auctions over a period of more than two years. In 1658, he moved to a smaller rental house in the Jordan district, and even though he remained active as an artist and received some prominent commissions, Rembrandt's fortunes never rebounded again after the bankruptcy. He died on the 4th of October, 1669, an absolute pauper, and was buried in an unmarked grave in the Westerkerk in Amsterdam. Between 1655 and 1791, for 136 years, the Polish rider is altogether undocumented. We do not know where it was or who owned it, and, it makes, and this makes it virtually impossible for us to understand what the painting was created to mean to its original owners or subsequent owners in the 17th century. The letter from Oginski to the king from mid-August 1791 which I quoted at the beginning of this lecture, is the first documentary mention of the painting. This was discovered and published by Andrew Chekhanowiecki in 1960. Michał Kazimierz Oginski was a diplomat. He was the great hetman of Lithuania, a cousin uh, by marriage of the king, and art collector with particular interest in music and science. Here you see him in an early portrait on the left by the French artist Carmontel, and in a later one, closer in date to the 1790s, on the right, which is now at uh, Niborov. The letter is an important one, and it is worth quoting it again. Sire, I am sending your majesty a Cossack, whom Rembrandt had set on his horse. This horse has eaten during his stay with me for 420 German gulden. Your Majesty's justice and generosity allows me to expect that orange trees will flower in the same proportion. Bowing to your feet, Your Majesties, my Lord Masters, most humble servant, Michał Oginski, great hetman of Lithuania. It is a very short letter, but full of details and equally full of gaps which leave us wondering. Oginski had been on a diplomatic mission to both Germany and the Netherlands. For most of 1791, he was in The Hague. Even though it is most likely that he purchased the painting in the, land, in the Netherlands in the spring of 1791, it cannot altogether be excluded that he could have also bought it in Germany. The other curious factor in this letter is that it appears that Oginski offered the painting to the king in exchange for orange trees. And on the right, I'm showing you um, some plants, which may be orange trees, I'm not sure, 
probably not, uh, but these are in one of the bellottos uh, showing the castle uh, at the uh, Museum, Nar Museum Nardove. But just to give a sense of the gardens of the king. Stanislav August was known for his collection of potted citrus trees, especially those here at Wajenki. Shekhanovetsky proposed in 1960 that the trees were needed by Oginsky for the gardens of the house he had just purchased outside of Warsaw at Helenov, but we do not know if that was actually the case. Surely more research in the Oginsky papers may reveal more about the general context around this exchange. The final important detail of this letter is that Oginsky, for the first time, identifies the man on horseback as a Cossack, not a Polish cavalryman of any kind, but a foreign and exotic figure. Soon after 1791, Rembrandt's canvas appears in the Royal Collection's inventories and in the catalogue of Stanislav August's paintings, compiled between 1784 and 1792, the painting appears as Rembrandt, a Cossack on horseback. And I would like to thank uh, Dorota Yushtak for having provided so much information about the inventories of the king. This is not the place or time to talk in detail about the collection of King Stanislav August Poniatowski or about the history of his reign. Scholars in Poland, and in particular my colleague and co-curator, Dorota Juszczak, have done an incredible job with assembling thorough information on the subject and have published and will continue publishing about this topic. Stanislav August employed significant foreign artists like Marcello Bacciarelli, who became the court painter in 1764 and executed most of the king's portrait, like the, the one I'm showing you, and the Venetian Bernardo Bellotto, who moved to Poland in 1767 and worked here for the last 13 years of his life. Over the years, the king assembled a substantial collection of paintings, though, we have to say, their quality varied greatly, as the king's financial means did not always support his tastes and ambitions. There were 12 paintings in the collection attributed to Rembrandt, of which only three today are still recognized as being by him. For this, I direct you to the brilliant essay in the catalog by Dorota Juszczak. The king was said to have been particularly fond of horses and paintings depicting them. The dealers, Noël des Enfants and Peter Francis Bourgeois, who were allegedly tasked with assembling a collection of paintings for the king in England between 1790 and 1795, claimed that as the king of Poland was very fond of horses, his majesty particularly recommended the purchase of works of those masters most celebrated for painting them. Oginski most likely knew that the Polish rider was sure to meet with Stanislaw August's approval, both in terms of subject matter, a man on horseback, and in terms of the great painter who painted the work. The most important part of the king's collection of paintings was displayed here in the Palace on the Isle at Wajenki, the king's favorite residence, which he had entirely redecorated. Other works, of course, were on view at the Royal Castle in Warsaw and in other royal residences and locations. The Polish rider was in the king's collection for only a few years. It appears in inventories between 1793 and 1795, valued between 180 and 200 ducats. By 1795, the painting was in the antechamber on the upper floor at the palace at Wajenki, at the entrance of a suite of rooms that led to the king's bedroom. From the research of Dorota Yushak, we now know that the painting hung originally between these two doors, and here it is as we tried it out between the doors. Unfortunately, the doors were la later enlarged, and it is impossible now to hang the painting where the king knew it. This photograph was taken last week and shows more or less how the Rembrandt would have looked in this room. And we have to also remember that during the king's lifetime, the painting was always there, was never in the painting's gallery, as far as we know. In November 1795, after the third and last partition of Poland, Stanislaw August abdicated. Poland was ceased to exist as a country on the world map until 1918, after World War I, when it regained its independence as a sovereign state. Having given up his kingdom, Stanislaw August planned to move to Rome, but instead traveled to Grodno. Not a great choice compared to Rome, but I should say that. Uh, but he didn't really have a choice. And then to St. Petersburg, where he spent the last two years of his life. 
Lists were made of the paintings meant to follow the king in Rome, in theory, and then to Grodno. And the Polish rider was on those lists. On the 16th of January, 1796, Marcello Bacciarelli informed the king that a number of paintings, including the Rembrandt, had been removed from the first floor antechamber of the Wajenki Palace in preparation for their shipment. The paintings were placed in 13 crates that were hidden first in the theater of the royal castle and then in a boathouse here at Wajenki. They were, in fact, never sent to Grodno or to Russia, but remained in Warsaw and between 1797 and 1799 were unpacked and returned to the rooms of the Wajenki Palace on the Isle. The Polish rider is described as being in the picture gallery, the Galerie en bas, on the ground floor, which was also used as a billiard room. On February 12, 1798, Stanislaw August died of a stroke in the Marble Palace in St. Petersburg. He had lived with a Polish rider at Wajenki for slightly less than four years. However, the painting was to remain at Wajenki for a total of almost 23 years. After 1795, the king's collection was inherited by his nephew, Józef Poniatowski, and remained in Warsaw at Wajenki. On the 1st of February, 1811, a young Polish aristocrat, Valeria Stroinowska, saw the painting at Wajenki and recorded it in her diary. That day, she visited the palace on the Isle with her mother-in-law and noted, this apartment of Stanislaw August has remained absolutely the same, in the same state since his departure from his capital to Grodno in 1795. This armchair, this desk, this inkwell, these pens, the scattered papers, this calendar open to the year 1794, all that hurts, and we escaped with pleasure from these sad memories. In the billiard room, the painting's gallery on the ground floor, she said that among several great Rembrandts were a Jew and his daughter, and a Lisovchek, that Yash persists in believing to be Stanislav Stroinovsky, how I would love to buy that if I had the money, because in this beautiful and rich Wajenki, everything is for sale. Stroinovska's husband, Jan Felix Tarnowski, believed that the Polish rider was a portrait of his wife's distant ancestor, Colonel Stanislaw Stroinowski, who in the 17th century had been in the mercenary army under the command of Alexander Józef Wysowski, active in Poland and Lithuania during the Thirty Years' War. The soldiers following him were known in Poland as Lysowczycy. Valeria Stroinowska's journal is the first evidence of the king's Cossack being renamed a Lysowczyk. During its 119 years in Poland, the Polish rider assumed a patriotic symbolism, one that surely Rembrandt never envisioned for this painting. In Poland, Rembrandt's painting and the military figure of the Lisowczyk became conflated since Valeria Tarnowska's, Tarnowska's comments in 1811. Even though the Lisowczyks did not have specific uniforms and no contemporary evidence survives as to what exactly they wore, the figure in the Polish rider was a crucial one in shaping the appearance of the Lysowczyks in Polish imagination. In 1843, an article and book about the Lysowczyks by Maurice Dziedzuszewski uh, were accompanied by a print after Rembrandt's painting to show what a Lysowczyk wore. In the text, the author also claimed that the Tarnowski coat of arm, the Leliva, could be seen on the quiver of the rider. Even though there is clearly no Leliva in the painting, a Polish periodical published a few years later in 1859 an illustration of Alisovchek that was clearly based on Rembrandt's painting, plus the added moustache, and it included a prominent Leliva on the figure's quiver. It has been argued that the costume worn by the Polish rider may not even be Polish, and many options have been put forward. But the studies of art historian Gisław Zygulski demonstrate that most of what the rider is wearing can indeed be considered Polish. The clothes and weapons are consistent with what would have been worn and used by Polish light cavalry, even though obviously the borders of countries at that time were quite vague and we cannot exclude that someone from Lithuania or Hungary or a number of other countries may have worn similar outfits. 
The rider wears a long quilted coat with buttons running along its front, a jupan. The fur hat, a kuchma, is of the time that originated in Mongolia and became popular in Persia, among the Tatars, in Russia, and in Lithuania. The bow, quiver, and arrows also followed an Asian type, which was common in Poland and was created actually by Armenian craftsmen in Lvov. Polish cavalry often also wore two sabers, a carabela, which is named after a location near Baghdad and their depiction in the painting is consistent with 17th century examples. Of Scythian origins, the warhammer, or najak, was also used by Polish cavalry. In the Polish rider, the breed of horse, the saddle over a leopard skin, and even the horse's tail, cut and attached as a decoration to the neck of the animal, a bunchuk, are typically Polish. A figure wearing almost exactly the same outfit as the rider, actually appears in the Stockholm Scroll, a depiction by an anonymous painter of the 1605 wedding procession of King Sigmund III and Constance of Austria into Krakow. And this, of course, is one of the great treasures at the royal castle here in Warsaw. Polish costumes were based on rich mixtures of Western and Eastern fashion. This was partly a reflection of the myth that Polish people descended not from Slavs, but from the Sarmatians, a nomadic people originally from Persia. As the historian Adam Zamoyski has explained, as a result of contacts with Hungary and Ottoman Turkey, various accrut accrutements of Persian origin were gradually incorporated into everyday use, and by the end of the 16th century, a distinct Oriental Polish costume had evolved. The Poles were close to their horses, which were symbols of their warrior status. They were tacked in fine harness, covered in rich cloth, adorned with plumes and even wings, and on high day and holidays dyed. Usually cochineal, but black, mauve, or green were favored for funerals. The Polish Commonwealth was turning into a hybrid of East and West, increasingly exotic, but also baffling to Western Europeans. This Sarmatian lifestyle was a unique growth, produced by cross-pollination between Catholic High Baroque and Ottoman culture. Western Europeans were fascinated by Polish costume, especially when large embassies from Poland visited foreign countries. Two such celebrated events were the establishment um, of the Polish embassy of Jerzy Ossolinski in Rome in 1633 and that of Krzysztof Opalinski in Paris in October 1645. Upon, upon witnessing the latter, François de Motvy, one of the ladies-in-waiting of the French Queen and of Austria, commented, there is something in their magnificence which looks very savage. The Florentine printmaker Stefano della Bella portrayed members of the Polish embassies in both Paris and Rome, and he produced images, other images in print, of Polish cavalry. It is very likely that actually della Bella and Rembrandt knew each other, and of course the link between the Polish rider and della Bella prints has been made many times before. If the king's collection was informally for sale by 1811, nothing actually happened until Józef Poniatowski, fighting on Napoleon's side against the Russians, died drowning at the Battle of Leipzig in October 1813. The collection at Wazienki was inherited by Józef's sister, Maria Teresa Ceskiewicz, which you see in an earlier portrait here by Bacciarelli, who sold a number of paintings uh, uh, in Warsaw between 1814 and 1821. The majority of the collection was eventually sold in 1817, together with Wazienki, to Tsar Alexander I. But on the 3rd of June 1814, the Polish rider was sold to Franciszek Savere Drutski Lubetski for 150 ducats, with Ernst Johann Sartorius de Schwanefeld acting as an intermediary. And you see Drutski Lubetski on the, on the right. Drutski Lubetski, however, seems to have acquired the painting only as an investment, and a very good one. A few months after the purchase, he resold it to Jeronim Stronowski, Bishop of Vilno, for the steep price of 500 ducats, five times what he had paid for it a few months before. And here you see the Bishop of Vilno on the left. When Stronowski died in 1815, only a year later, his younger brother, Valerian Stronowski, on the right, inherited the painting and brought it to his house at Horochov 
in um, Voin in modern day Ukraine. And the house doesn't exist anymore, but here you see it in uh, a 19th century watercolor and in two uh, old photographs. It is likely that the Polish rider remained at Horochów until Valerian Stroinowski's death in 1834, even though we're not entirely sure. Valerian's daughter was that same Valeria Stroinowska who had seen the painting at Wazienki in 1811 and had first described it at, as a Lisovchek. It is entirely unclear when Valerian gave the Rembrandt to his daughter, if it was a gift before his death or if she inherited it in 1834. In 1833, we know that the painting was sent to Vienna, where it is documented as being restored for the very first time. But it is unclear if it was sent there by Valerian or by his daughter Valeria. It is also entirely possible that Valeria and her husband, Jan Felix Tarnowski, had been behind Hieronym Stroinowski's acquisition of the painting a few years earlier in 1814, as the couple was well known for their interest in the arts. Jan Felix was a bibliophile, bibliophile and Valeria was particularly fascinating by the visual arts and she is known to have been a very accomplished miniaturist. Among the great works that they acquired, the most important, apart from the Rembrandt, was Antonio Canova's Perseus with the head of Medusa, now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which they commissioned in Rome and had shipped to Poland in 1806, and which was also displayed at Orochów. The couple, however, established their residence at Gików, the main seat of the Tarnowski family in Galicia, where the medieval manor house of the Tarnowskis had been remodeled in the 1830 in the Gothic revival style. The Polish rider was moved to Gików, where it remained more or less uninterruptedly for the next 75 years and through four generations of the Tarnowski family. Four inventories record the painting at Gikov between the 1830s and the early 20th century. The first inventory from about 1834, soon after Valerian Stroinowski's death, lists the Rembrandt in Valeria's drawing room, a Lisovchek bought in Holland by Count Oginski for the picture gallery of Stanislav August, from where it got into the hands of Prince Józef Poniatowski during the auction of paintings from the Wazienki it was bought from there by Bishop Stroinowski for 500 ducats. By the time of the second inventory, on the 1st of December 1844, the painting still hung in the mistress's drawing room, Pokui Bavial Diavialne Pani. The inventory also indicates that the painting had been purchased by Oginski in Amsterdam for King Stanislav August. But of course, the mentions that the painting was bought in Holland in these two inventories have to be taken with a pinch of salt. After the death of Jan and Valeria uh, Tarnowski, the Polish rider was inherited by their eldest son, Jan Bogdan Tarnowski, and then by their grandson, Jan Jerisław Tarnowski, and remained at Gikov. An 1872 inventory lists the painting as being in the great hall of the house. While Rembrandt's painting remained at Gikov through most of the second half of the 19th century, it seems to have been largely forgotten by four foreign scholars. Willem von Bode, the director of the Berlin Museums, claimed to have seen the Polish rider in Vienna some time ago when the painting was being restored again and published it in 1883. The canvas had in fact been in Vienna in 1877, possibly for a second restoration and potentially already for sale. By the early 20th century, the painting belonged to the fourth generation of the Tarnowski family, to Jan and Valeria's great-grandson, Gisław. An inventory compiled before 1910 briefly described the Rembrandt Lisovchek in the drawing room of the elder countess, Gisław's mother, Zofia Tarnowska, née Zamoyska. In September 1897, Abraham Bredius, the director of the Moritz House in The Hague, traveled to Poland and to Russia to conduct research for a Rembrandt exhibition he was planning in Amsterdam. Bredius recalled that while waiting for a colleague at his hotel in Kraków in April, he was struck by a curious sight. As I saw a magnificent carriage drawn by four horses past my hotel, I learned from the doorman that it was Count Tarnowski. 
who had been engaged to the beautiful Countess Potocka, who would bring him a considerable fortune upon marriage, and little did I know at the time that the man was also the lucky owner of one of the most wonderful works by Rembrandt, a great master. The 35-year-old Gisław Tarnowski was in fact engaged to Zofia Potocka, whom he would marry on the 5th of August, 1897. Upon inquiring, Bradius was told that Tarnowski owned a Rembrandt. Through the introduction of Jerzy Mietzielski, a cousin of Tarnowski, he was introduced to visit Gikov, and the two traveled together in Galicia. At the time, Michelski was working on a catalog of Stanislav August's collection and knew the Polish writer. Bredius later recalled, it was a very long way, and all those little spur lines of the Galician railways, everything goes so slowly that you could run next to the train if you were so inclined. Bredius and Michelski reached the castle during the preparations for the, imp the impending wedding. New stables were being built, the house was being worked on, everything for the impending marriage, of course. There is a lot of rubbish on the walls of this gigantic hall in this very curious building. In the house, Bredius was confronted for the first time with the Polish rider. There it hung, only one gaze, a closer look of a few seconds as to technique, all was needed to convince me at once that there, hidden away in this isolated place, had been hanging one of Rembrandt's greatest masterpieces for almost a hundred years. As he stood in front of the painting, Bredius took some notes and sketched the painting. Not the most beautiful sketch, but it is. <laughs> Back in Holland, Bredius started working on his Rembrandt exhibition. It was organized to celebrate the inauguration of Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands, which would take place in the Neuve Kirk on the 6th of September of that year and would be on view between the 8th of September and the 31st of October, 1898, in the newly built Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. Bredius would ultimately bring together 123 paintings by Rembrandt, the largest se selection of works by the artist ever assembled at that time. And if you want to see how the Night Watch moved from the Rijksmuseum to the Stedelijk, this is how it was transported. And um, I think it's one of the very few times, if not the only one, that the Rijksmuseum lent the Night Watch to an exhibition. Having rediscovered the Polish rider, Bredius tried to convince Tarnowski to lend the painting to the exhibition. He persuasively wrote to Tarnowski to convince him to lend the picture. Except for the two documented trips in 1833 and 1877, as far as we know, the painting had never left Gikov for more. Bredius wrote, I understand that you're afraid of confiding it to strange hands, but you will bestow a great kindness in showing this jewel just for once to the public and for only two months. Bredius's power of persuasion were well honed. He continued, make us happy. We will be grateful and come and see, see it with the Countess, this interesting exhibition which will allow you to cast a glance over the curious little country which we call the Netherlands. The painting ultimately did travel to Amsterdam, where it was on view as a portrait of the Polish rider wearing the uniform of a Lisowski regiment in a landscape. A label on the back still survives from the exhibition. In 1898, the Lisowczyk had officially become the Polish rider. Twelve years later, on the 5th of April 1910, the British art critic and painter Roger Fry on the left sent a cable to the American industrialist and art collector Henry Clay Frick on the right in New York. Can secure Rembrandt Polish Cavalier, 60,000 pounds, urge acceptance, decision must reach me on the 18th. The next day, Fry explained that the painting was in excellent condition and had left Gikov only once for the 1898 exhibition in Amsterdam. Fry had not had time to see the painting in Poland, but recommended to Frick its purchase. Frick immediately responded, purchase, but try for lower price. Leave matter of condition of picture with you. Payment should be made on delivery here, but you have authority to do as you think best in all matters. In a subsequent letter from the 24th of April, Fry explained his involvement in the sale. After the 1898 exhibition, the Polish rider had become famous and very valuable. Gisław Tarnowski, 
here in a beautiful portrait by Malchewski, whom Fry described rather ungraciously as a good-natured, rather rustic country gentleman with the obstinate suspicion of a peasant, quite unused to business and extremely difficult to deal with, especially as he only speaks very bad French, had decided to sell the painting in 1910 and had put his younger brother, Adam, a diplomat at the Austrian embassy in London, in charge of the sale. Gisouave wanted to sell the painting for half a million francs, but received an offer of 44,000 pounds with an expiration date of April 20. Looking into the value of the painting, Adam Tarnowski in London contacted Carfax and Company, one of the local galleries. The principal there, Arthur Clifton, immediately contacted Fry after Tarnowski's inquiry. Fry thought that the price offered was too low and that Tarnowski could sell it for much more. When asked about a possible buyer, Fry immediately thought of Frick, who was known for his purchases of old master paintings, and in these years he was really buying the top of the art market in Europe. Fry thought that a reasonable price would be between 80 and 100,000 pounds, but he and Tarnowski ultimately agreed that 60,000 pounds would do, and Fry immediately offered the painting to Frick. The whole affair of the sale took place over just a few days. Only four days after the initial cable, on the 19th of April, Fry wrote, sale concluded, but Count insists I inspect the picture in situ. Gisław Tarnowski insisted that Fry travel to Poland to pick up the painting. A day later, Fry wrote to New York again, owner, honest, country gentleman, unbusinesslike, very nervous, insists on selling picture from Chateau. I received it there against the check. So I go to Tarnowski Chateau with great personal inconvenience. Frick responded that same day, have cabled 60,000 pounds to your credit. On the 25th of April, Fry traveled to Poland. The previous day, he had written to his mother. Just now, I have to go to Poland to buy for Mr. Frick a very important picture. The owner is a rather stupid country gentleman who insists on selling the picture in his chateau. That's why I have to go and get it, and I must see it before buying. It is tiresome and rather hateful work, but I couldn't refuse to do it. I hope Mr. Frick will be more decent to me than his fellow millionaires. At all events, I ought to get handsomely paid for all I've done, and indeed it comes at a very critical time for I am just at the end of all my resources and have been feeling very anxious of late as to how I can possibly meet my expenses. By the 6th of June, Frick had paid a 5% commission of 3,000 pounds to Fry. In the spring of 1910, the Polish rider left Poland. Two issues needed to be resolved before the painting could be sent to New York. Gisław Tarnowski had asked Fry for an exact copy of the painting to display at Gikow. The Rembrandt was then sent to London, where the painter Ambrose McAvoy produced a copy in early July 1910. On the 22nd of January 1911, Tarnowski wrote from Gikov that he had received the painting and that the copy of the Lisovchik is truly remarkably beautiful. Fry had written to Frick on the 9th of May 1910 about a second issue. One matter that I must see to is that of the frame. The present one is altogether impossible, and I'm trying to find a suitable, better one. The frame that Fry described as impossible was actually the frame that King Stanislaw August had placed on the painting in 1791. Thanks to the research of Michał Przygoda, we can now determine that between 1791 and 1910, the Rembrandt had one of the frames which followed the constant, consistent design made for the King's collection in those years. When exhibited in Amsterdam in 1898, the painting clearly was shown still in the King's collection frame. The issue of the frame was resolved a few months later. Nödler has found a frame which suits the picture admirably and it looks incredibly beautiful, Fry wrote on the 17th of, Ju of June. Frick paid $150 for the frame on the 14th of October. The, history of the, the histories, the stories of the copy by McAvoy and the frame are actually inextricably linked. While the original Rembrandt traveled to America in its new frame, which is the painting's present day frame, the Frick collection, the copy by McAvoy was sent to Gikov in the King's frame. 
A photograph from 1916 to 17 shows the copy on the landing of the main staircase at Gikov framed still in the king's frame. In December 1927, however, a serious fire at Gikov Castle destroyed both McAvoy's copy and the frame, so they don't survive any longer. Soon after Frick's purchase of the painting, stories started circulating in the press. There, was, there were few complaints in the Polish press, and only a group of Polish historians led by Zygmunt Batowski criticized the sale openly. But on the 26th of April 1910, the New York Times reported the following. Count Gisław Tarnowski of Kraków is rumored in the London art circles, has sold his very fine Rembrandt entitled The Polish Rider for $300,000. It is rumored that it has been purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But it was stated by the museum yesterday that this is erroneous. By the 3rd of July, the Times announced that the magnificent Rembrandt, the Polish Rider, which Henry Clay Frick has purchased through Carfax and Company at London, will probably be seen in New York and Londoners have been having the last opportunity to look at it at Carfax Gallery. For most of June of that year, Carfax had shown the painting in his gallery in London before sending it to New York. The painting reached Frick on the 21st of July at Eagle Rock, his summer home at Pride's Crossing in Massachusetts. Frick, notoriously shy and taciturn, cable fry the next day with one word, enchanted. Frick paid $308,651.25 for the Polish rider, 293,162.50 for the painting, 14,613.75 for the commission to fry, 850 for the frame, and 25 in duty charges to get it to America. Gisław Tarnowski and his wife, Zofia Potocka, were among the wealthiest people in Poland in the early 20th century. So why did they sell the Polish rider? After the partition of Poland in 1795, the area of Kraków and Galicia, where the Tarnowskis lived, was under Austrian rule. During the century when Poland did not exist as a country, the Poles periodically attempted to reclaim their homeland. At the end of the 19th century, images of Polish riders, Cossacks, and Lisowczeks emerged as a potent symbol of growing nationalism. During the time the painting was in relative obscurity at Dzikow, Polish artists began to focus on themes related to the history of their homeland. When disaster overtook the Commonwealth, as Adam Zamoyski observed, artists began to render not the present, but the past, often in an idealized form. This gave rise to a tradition of patriotic genre painting, lances on picket duty, Husaria, the charge, and other scenes which implied the glories of the past. In this context, the Rembrandt became an important model for Polish painters. About 1860 to 65, Juliusz Kosak copied the Polish rider, and the painting, the copy is now in the National Museum here in Warsaw. Kosak must have visited Dzikow and seen the Polish rider, but it is unclear if he did so before or after he moved to Kraków. Both he and his son, Wojciech, portrayed the owner of the Rembrandt, Gisław Tarnowski, and you see one of the portraits by Kosak of Tarnowski on the right. So it is likely that both father and son knew Dzikow and knew the painting well. During the second half of the 19th century, many images of Lisowczeks, Polish horsemen, and Cossacks were inspired by the painting at Dzikow. Here is only another example by Cossack, but painters like Cossack, Józef Brandt, and Józef Chomonski, in particular, devoted their careers to depictions of horsemen in Polish countryside, representing the hero heroism of a vanished kingdom. The Austrians did not recognize many of the land properties of the Polish aristocracy, such as the large tracts of land in the Sandomierz forest, forest which the Tarnowski had rights to since the Middle Ages. Jan Bogdan Tarnowski had already attempted to buy back part of this land, but did not have sufficient resources. In the early 20th century, the land belonged to a German named David Frank. When he decided to sell one of the estate, at uh, Mokshishov, and here's the house still there in the forest, um, Gisław Tarnowski, together with his brothers, Julius and Adam, and their uncle, Stanisław, a professor at the Jagiellonian University, purchased the forest. The money used to buy the land came from Gisław's wife's dowry, from Zofia Potocka, but also from the sale of the Polish rider. 
at a time when aristocratic families were trying to secure as much of their homeland as possible to keep it in Polish hands, the Tarnowski sale of a work of art for this purpose was seen as a patriotic act. In May 1910, after returning from Poland, Roger Fry wrote to his mother, on the way back from Dzikow, I saw two storks in their nests. It is a wonderful sight. The bird and the nest both look so much too big for the trees. Like this, only you must imagine that this is quite a big tree, and you'll see how top-heavy the whole thing looks, but the storks seem very happy up there. The Poles seem to dream of having their country back again, and indeed it is quite monstrous that they shouldn't, for they are quite a big people with a great deal of national feeling. I can't understand why one country ever should govern another, can you? Only we, the Brits, are rather bad offenders in that way. For the last, um, what is interesting also I should mention, and rather poetic, is that the Polish rider arrives in Poland in exchange for orange trees and leaves in exchange for a forest. For the last 112 years, the Polish rider has hung in the West Gallery of Henry Clay Frick's house at 1 East 70th Street in New York. And here you see it in the West Gallery. Of course, the building is now the Frick Collection since it opened to the public in 1935. In the same way for that for a century, between the early 19th and the early 20th century, the painting inspired generations of patriots, poets, and artists in Poland. For the past century, that same painting has inspired generations in the United States and in the Western world in general, in a number of other meaningful ways providing inspiration, for example, to the sculptor Alberto Giacometti or the novelists Marguerite Yourcenard and Iris Murdoch, among many others. In particular, in her 1993 novel, The Green Knight, Murdoch wrote, looking towards the Polish rider, she met his calm, tender, gentle, thoughtful gaze. She thought, what he sees is the face of death. He sees the silence of the valley its emptiness, its innocence, and beyond it, the hideous field of war on which he will die. And this poor horse will die too. He is courage, he is love, he loves what is good and will die for it. His body will be trampled by horses' hooves and no one will know his grave. In December 1944, Julius Held published what is probably the most poetic article on the painting at the end of World War II. In it, he described the Rembrandt painting and the shining youth who himself seems to be in search of something distant, unmindful of things close and familiar. This youth marching fully armed towards the unknown signifies again something else to us today as we witness the horrors of yet another war in Ukraine and we imagine other soldiers losing their lives to defend their homeland. We do not know for whom Rembrandt painted the Polish rider or what he intended it to mean. How it came to be in Michał Kazimierz Oginski's possession in 1791 is still shrouded in mystery. Notwithstanding his rigorous and exhaustive study of the painting, Julius Held had to admit, the writer still withholds much from our ever-questioning minds. My two predecessors at the Frick Collection, former chief curators, reached similar conclusions. Edgar Manhol wrote in 1970 that the Polish rider still eludes a precise iconographical interpretation and a known youth riding at twilight through an ominous landscape with towers, cliffs, and a dimly discernible pond at the edge of which glows a fire. And Colin Bailey in 2011 concluded that, try as they may, historians have been unable to find any narrative, biblical, historical, literary, that satisfactorily explains the subject of Rembrandt's painting. But the fascination with the masterpiece endures. The Polish rider has signified different things to different people over more than 200 years. Yet, no satisfactory explanation for the painting has been reached. The British art historian Kenneth Clark hauntingly wrote that, beyond that, the Pol Polish rider remains something mysterious, some memory of a journey into the world of the imagination where we cannot accompany him. But I would like to finish on a more positive note. In New York, the Polish rider has become one of the central images in an altogether different piece of literature, one that is not linked to the imagery of war, 
violence, independence, or identity, but rather a broader manifesto of love. In 1960, the poet and curator Frank O'Hara wrote a poem entitled, Having a Coke with You. O'Hara was to die tragically young, age 40, run over by a truck on the beach on Fire Island in July 1966. The poem was published a year before his death in his celebrated lunch poems, and it has become one of his most famous creations. The poem and the painting also inspired a piece of music by New Jackson in 2014. The poem was written for O'Hara's lover, the ballet dancer Vincent Warren, and here you see them together in a photograph from around that time just before O'Hara died. In the same way this evening, I would like to conclude this lecture by reading this beautiful poem and by actually dedicating it to the person who's really responsible for my love for the Polish rider and for its latest journey to Poland. He knows who he is. Having a Coke with you is even more fun than going to San Sebastian, Irun, Hendaye, Biarritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Traversera de Gracia in Barcelona, partly because in your orange shirt you look like a better, happier Saint Sebastian, partly because of my love for you, partly because of your love for yogurt, partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches, partly because of the secrecy a smiles take on before people and statuary, it is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary, when right in front of it, in the warm New York four o'clock light, we're drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you, and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world, except possibly for the Polish rider occasionally. And anyway, it's in the Frick, which thanks heaven you haven't gone to yet, so we can go together for the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully, more or less, takes care of futurism, just as at home I never think of the nude descending a staircase or, a, or at a rehearsal, a single drawing of Leonardo Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them when they never got the right person to stand near the right tree when the sun sank? Or for that matter, Marino Marini, when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse. It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience, which is not going to be wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. Thank you. Do we do questions, if anyone wants to ask questions? Could I see if you worried about sure. the rest of the collection will happen to it? I'm, I, yeah, I can introduce this. is yeah? actually Jan Tarnowski, who is the grandson yeah. of Gisław Tarnowski, so <laughs> he knows Jiku very well in the collection. Yeah. <laughs> Kolekcja Dzikowska została y, przeniesiona z Chorochowa do Dzikowa. Y, duża część jej w każdym razie. Y, była w Dzikowie do 27 roku, kiedy zamek Dzikowski się spalił. Y, to był ogromny dramat, bo zginęło dziewięć osób ale większość dzieł sztuki i biblioteki zostały uratowanych przez głównie y, młodych y, harcerzy, y, studentów, y, no, dużo pracowników Dzikowa. W każdym razie y, uratowało się, zamek został odbudowany y, w 30 roku, wszystko zostało, co zostało, zostało sprowadzone z powrotem, a i potem 39. wojny. Mój ojciec poszedł na ochotnika do wojska, 
a z pełnomocnik miał się zająć ukrycia najcenniejszych obiektów w lasach, w piwnicach. W każdym razie dużo się uratował. I dzisiaj, a w 44 roku jeszcze, władze perelowskie chcieli wymazać kolekcję dzikowską i rozparcelowali ją tak samo jak i majątek po najróżniejszych muzeach i, i, i swoich biurach i tak dalej. Od 30 lat staram się, starałem się, bo już teraz prawie się udało, scalić kolekcję dzikowską znowu i udostępnić publiczności. Zresztą Państwo mogą znaleźć w tym internecie. Jest kolekcja dzikowska Tarnobyl. I jak, jak macie czas i ochotę, to pojechać i zobaczyć. Bo rzeczywiście to zabiera, nabiera bardzo takiej, może specjalnej formy, ale, ale jest, jest na co popatrzeć. Tyle. Dziękuję. Czy mają Państwo jakieś pytania do naszego gościa? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, where is your cocktail? Well, sorry. Where is your cocktail? No, here. Uh, and the second one, uh, what would you like to take uh, with you besides the orange trees? for exchange uh, and show uh, in uh, New York to the public in New York uh, what wor work of arts from our museum would you like to show American public? Wow. It's a good question. Um, I, there are many, many things and I'm a, I'm a great fan of American museums, uh, sorry, of, of Polish museums um, and, you know, of course I'm not going to answer, you know, the Leonardo in Krakow, but um, everyone would love that. Uh, but there are many works, I mean, here at Wajenki, sorry, uh, in, um, in the National Museum at the Royal Castle. Um, we're in fact working on some projects with some museums thinking about future projects of showing certain Polish artists in, in, in New York. Um, so there are many things. I mean, a particular favorite of mine, which has nothing to do with the Polish writer, is Malczewski. I'm a great fan of Malczewski and I'd love to see lots of Malczewski in New York where there isn't any. Um, but um, there are many you know, other great works. Sorry? I'm not going to be more precise. I'm going to be <laughs> mysterious. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for your fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, I had a huge pleasure to work as an intern at the Frick at the moment when the work on the exhibition started, so it's wonderful to see how the project developed and flourished. I really enjoyed in your presentation the multiplicity of identities that you pointed out throughout this, you know, object history and uh, its mediations across countries, across cultures, across strata of society, with Hungary, with Lithuania, with Poland, with America, the Dutch, uh, Netherlands. Uh, if you were in an ideal world and you could put a new name onto the painting, reflecting your own take on those identities, not on the iconographical level, which is so limited, but rather on this more broader notion that you pointed out, what would that be? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think I will always see it as the Polish writer, because to me, you know, the, its history is so directly linked to the history of Poland at a very specific time in the history of Poland that I think that link has become part of the picture itself. 
you know, I wonder if we will ever find out what it actually means. Um, I have grown more and more convinced of the idea that it probably is a history painting or a biblical scene. You know, it may be the return of the prodigal son or King David going to battle. And I think, you know, considering what Rembrandt did with his works, it clearly fits with that more than this idea of, a, you know, a Polish knight um, represented for romantic reasons. But I think to me, it, it remains the Polish rider. Uh, maybe not necessarily as specific as, as a Lisovchek, but, you know, the idea of this image of, you know, a country and, and people that valiantly for more than 100 years fought to get their home like, homeland back. And I think that significance to the painting uh, will always remain with it. Yeah. No, I mean, the question of, you know, where's the horse from, you know, there's been lots of discussions of, you know, is it a Polish horse, is it not a Polish horse? I mean, uh, the background, you know, the architecture in the background is clearly not Polish. I mean, it, it looks like a kind of, you know, Eastern city, but it's absolutely imagined. And yeah, sort of New Jersey, yeah. So the, the biblical idea is something, you know, it's something exotic and, you know, it's clearly a young man on his way to battle or coming back from battle, we don't really know. Uh, but there is no att attribute that is precise enough to tell us what it is. Uh, you know, same with the Jewish bride. It's a man and a woman who clearly either love each other or are getting married, but we don't know who they are. So um, Rembrandt, in a way, likes these subjects to be so strange that he makes our life as art historians pretty impossible because, oh, actually makes it more fun that we can write lots of articles, having lots of ideas and coming up with different ideas. But, um, you know, unless a document like with the Aristotle comes up, who knows? The costume is, you know, most likely Polish. Rembrandt had a lot of links to Poland, so he could have got hold of a costume like that, which maybe was displayed in his Kunstkammer in the house. Um, and I think he just picked it as something that looked fun and was interesting and he needed to make the, the figure look exotic and not Netherlandish or biblical. And, and actually, if you think of 17th century Amsterdam, you know, people had a very vague idea of what people wore in, at the times of the Bible. So this idea of something strange and exotic is something that people related to. Um, you know, we don't know who the man is. And as I've said before, also some scholars argue that it's a woman and not a man, which I, I think it probably is a man. But, um, you know, is it a portrait of Rembrandt's son or was Rembrandt's son acting as a model? Is it meant to be a specific person? You know, we don't know. But yes, you know, the outfit is Polish and that's a pretty big, um, big thing. Um, Held in his 1944 article wrote very cheekily that if the painting had been found or bought in a Hungarian castle, we would know it as the, as the Hungarian rider, um, which is probably true. Um, so, but the reality is it was in a Polish castle. It was in Poland for more than a century. And, um, and so Polish rider, it remains. Well, the, the question of what would have happened if, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the painting could be at the Hermitage right now. The painting could have been destroyed. I mean, it could have been destroyed in the fire in 1927, even before the war. You know, the fire destroyed most of the house, so it could have been destroyed in the house. I mean, the what if, of course, you know, there's lots of other options. So, um, you know, I'm glad that it made it through history and it still exists and it's on public view and it can travel to Poland. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, with all works of art, the, you know, what if. I mean, other paintings that were at Wajenki, I don't need to say this, but obviously had very different histories. So some are back at Wajenki, others are in other museums, others are in Russia, many are lost. So the history of, of this entire part of the world, let's say, through the war and even before the war and after the war, um, it's very complicated. So I think it's difficult to say exactly what would have happened to it, but I think there are a number of tragic options that could have happened to it. Um, so. Yeah, and many things went missing and we don't know what's happened to them. Right. And yet, uh, 
He had uh, both Austrian and Russian soldiers uh, yeah. being cared for. And that's why the, none of the armies really looted, because they, the, the Russians would have looted it clean. <laughs> Do you have any other questions to our guests? I think there's a question down there. Um, hi, I have missed the 10 minutes uh, the, uh, of, the, of your presentation, and I have not uh, known anything about the, about the painting at all, but I was wondering through your research and perhaps th through your travel to Poland before, I don't know if you have been to Poland before, um, what have you found out about, what have you learned about Poland? Um, because, you know, now is war in Ukraine, so I'm learning a lot about Ukraine. And I'm curious what, what you have learned. Um, well, um, the short answer is a lot. It's fair to say that before I, I came to Poland for, for a project, and, you know, the project wasn't really the exhibition to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. The project was a, a book that was published by the Freik, which actually Mr. Tarnowski has been kind enough to give me a copy so I can promote it. Um, this, this is the first book that came out, and the catalog of the exhibition here is a revised, expanded, better version of this um, with an extra essay by uh, uh, Dr. Yushchak. Um, you know, I came four or five years ago, it was 2018, and I had a very vague knowledge of Poland and Polish history. I mean, I'd been once before to Krakow uh, many years ago. Um, and I've really grown to, to love Polish culture. I mean, especially, of course, related to the 18th and 19th century. I mean, I'm, you know, more than contemporary. I, I know much less about contemporary Polish um, culture. But I, you know, I love the country. I love the institutions, the museums, the works of art, the countryside. I love the language, even though I'm still struggling with it. Uh, so it's been, you know, for me, it's been a real discovery of a country through this work. Could you give us a couple of characteristic, uh, characteristics? What have been surprising for you? You know, of course, yes, uh, landscape, people, culture, yeah. but what's specifics? Like, you know, we n learn now that how courageous the Ukrainians are, which is huge inspiration. It, it, yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, you people know, the, in the West don't know much about Poland overall. Like the Germans, which are our neighbors, they know not much at all. They are interested in other nations. I just had the conversation recently with someone. Okay. So. No, no, no. But I, yeah, I mean, and I, you know, I've had a similar experience bringing um, American people who had never been to Poland in their lives, and all kind of coming back saying, "Oh my God, it's full of amazing things." Um, so I think you know, one thing is the variety. Um, so the variety of works of art from the past. And, you know, just to give you an example, who would know outside of Poland that, you know, an incredible collection of early medieval Egyptian frescoes is in the National Museum? I mean, the Faras Gallery is a unique thing in the world. Um, and those things, you know, from Sudan, and today's Sudan, Egypt, um, are an incredible treasure. You know, the Last Judgment by Memling in, in Gdańsk, uh, the great David portrait at, at Vilanov, um, but, you know, great collections of various families that have then ended up in museums or partly in museums. You know, of course, also a lot of the losses along the way. And um, um, an Italian artist called Domenico Gnoli, who died very young in the 70s, um, wrote, came to Warsaw in the 60s. And he wrote this very beautiful thing where he said that visiting Warsaw is like visiting the echo of a city. And there is this very beautiful poetry about that, about this idea of something that went, but returned, it's been reconstructed. You know, it's now historical in a different way. And, you know, that difference between what is reconstructed, what is original, becomes somewhat pointless as well. So I think the, the experience of a country that has gone through so much, through centuries, but has come out of it alive and with culture and, and you know, with great things there, I think it's, it's a great thing. And, it, and, and to me that, I mean, surprising is maybe the wrong word, but I, I have to admit I was very ignorant about Polish history and, and anything to do with Poland before that, in the same way that I'm probably very, you know, ignorant about Romanian history right now or, or even Hungarian. But that is part of, you know, the, the, the way that historical research brings you um, into contact with, with people. 
When I look for curators or colleagues um, in New York at the museum or in any museum, I always think the most important thing, you know, besides intelligence and the studies and all those things, is curiosity. People have to be curious, and people have to be curious about the other. You know, it's not just about what surrounds you, but what is foreign to you, what is far away, and we never stop learning, all of us. I mean, the world is a huge place with different cultures, with different art forms, music forms, literature forms, and I think discovering those and getting to know them is, for me at least, one of the greatest pleasures in life. So, um, you know, for me over the last five years, I have to say Poland has been a great part of my life. Um, but there are many other countries that I also deeply love and, and have worked in and work with, um, and that I keep discovering things. I was born and I grew up in Rome. I'm still discovering Rome 40 years later. So I think that idea that we all keep learning and, and asking questions and, and, and reading and seeing and, and listening to other people um, is part of it. Um, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is the fact that um, maybe it's a bit of a stereotype, but I find Polish people very noble and generous. And I think that is, you know, it's something that is very heartwarming for me. I mean, of course, there are always exceptions, but, um, you know, that's true <laughs> of everyone. But coming from America, um, the way I've been welcomed in the museum world by many colleagues, you know, here at Wajenki, but in every other institution I've been in, has always been really, really wonderful. So um, it's been also a discovery of, of meeting wonderful people, friends and colleagues. When I started this research, I got to meet people in a number of museums who helped me out. I mean, Dorota was one of them here at Wajenki, obviously, and she immediately shared all of her research. Uh, the Tarnowski family welcomed me immediately and, sh and shared with me a lot of the material that is unpublished that I then published in both of these books. So that kind of open door hospitality um, is something that really struck me and I, you know, I'm very appreciative for it. I'm very thankful. So unless there are other questions, I'm assuming people can go and see the painting too. No? Yeah. Zapraszamy Państwa po kolei wobec tego po 15 osób. Thank you, Xavier. It was so nice you've told about us, our co cooperation and so on. It was a great adventure also for us, me and Isabella, you know, to work with you. It was a pleasure. It was. <laughs> to możemy Państwa zaprosić pod obraz, ponieważ ze względów konserwatorskich musimy iść kolejeczką po 15 osób. To kto z Państwa obraz widział, no to, no to może niekoniecznie.